working for you. A weekly talk radio program which highlights developments of national interest and the activities of your St. Kitts Davis government. Join host Les Roy Williams as he presents news, views, reports, and interviews about everything regarding the activities of the Team Unity government and the building of our communities and the development of St. Kitts Davis. Tune in and call in to interact with your government and share your views regarding the upward forward development of your community and our beautiful Twin Island Federation. Working for you is weekly, every Wednesday live from 1.30 p.m. to 3 p.m. on ZIZ Radio, with FM, and Sugar City FM with we broadcast on participating stations. Working for you. Good afternoon, and I welcome you to another edition of Working for You. I am your host, Les Roy Williams. For all of you joining us, whether you're here in St. Kitts and Nevis or you are overseas, we want to welcome you in a very special way. Today I have with me an extremely special guest, and he's none other than the Speaker of the National Assembly, the St. Kitts and Nevis National Assembly, the Honorable Anthony Michael Perkins not Anthony Nigel Perkins. We will not make that mistake. And speaker, I want to welcome you to this program. And we look forward to a very lively discussion, a very healthy discussion about parliament, the functioning of parliament. And there's an extremely important um, event the Commonwealth Parliament Association is having a regional conference here sometime very soon, I think in, in probably a little over one week. And so we'll be having those discussions. But Speaker, you have been in the news quite a bit, I must say. Um, you know, the good, <laughs> the bad, and sometimes the ugly. But you were elected speaker on June 30th, 2016. A very important role, that is, to, to keep our parliament in order. And to rule out everything that is really disorder in, in the life of our parliament. But before you were speaker, could you give us a brief history of yourself? Who is Anthony Michael Perkins? Well, before I do that, Mr. Williams, first of all, let me say to you, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, pleasant good afternoon to all in um, radio land and internet land. I am happy to be here. I know we would have spoken earlier in the year in a, sure. a, a shorter a version of an interview following a particular decision in Parliament. And at that time, I could recall indicating that I look forward, or it was my intention to come repeatedly to um, yes. speak to parliamentary matters, parliamentary affairs, and to keep the, the public abreast to do a sort of education type process so that people can become more informed and knowledgeable about the, the workings of parliament. Sure. So I, I just wanted to, to say that, and so I'm happy to be here. I, look, I, I, I see this as like the, the second edition of, of my doing that. And sure. so I, I wanted to place that on, on record. So thanks for, for having me again. As to who I am and why I'm, how I got here, um, I'll, I'll try to be as brief as I can. I've been a, a primary school teacher, high school teacher. Um, I did attend Sixth Form College here in Sinkit some years ago. And a few of my classmates come to mind, including the Honourable Prime Minister, persons like uh, uh, Mr. Mark Wilkin and Nicholas Brisbane, Lincoln Pemberton, and so I, I do consider myself as having a, uh, a close knit with the, the Kittishan Society, so I'm not just a, a division, I, I consider myself to be a, a true federal um, sure. person. And so after school I went off to to college, like I said, I, I taught for a while, primary school, then high school, went off to college, did a degree in civil engineering, 
And after that, I managed to take up positions such as engineer, public works department, director of public works, project manager. And in the early 2000s, I entered or uh, ran for elective politics. I was elected in the nearest island administration. Was, I was a minister of works, um, infrastructure development, planning for a five-year period. Um, the CCM party lost government in 2006, so I had a break from po politics for a while. And then in fast forward to 2015, or before I get to that, between the period 2000 and 2010, that 10-year period, I was a senator within the federal parliament. So I had a 10 year stint as being a senator, nominated member on the opposition benches in parliament. So that was up to 2010. And so fast forward now to 2015, um, I was elected speaker of the National Assembly just under a year ago. So I, I think that kind of put things into, sure. into context. Well, to, well certainly uh, what, what my background. You, you have just outlined in terms mm. of your background is that you're basically no novice to the working of government. Um, you've been in parliament um, and so on. So you have quite a lot of experience that you bring to this post. I need to correct that something, you currently hold. Mr. Williams, sorry to, to cut you. I, I heard when I said I think 2016 as speaker. In 2015, I yes. was first deputy speaker, that nominated deputy speaker. Mm -hmm. And one year later, in 2016, then I was elected speaker. On, so June, wanted, on June 30th, yes, you, were, to, you were elected yeah, speaker. Wanted to correct that. Thank you. Before that, mm. we had the Honorable Franklin Brand, yes. who was mm. speaker. Mm. Now, the, the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association is holding its regional, a regional conference here um, in St. Kitts. St. Kitts is the host. Um, I would like you to give us an update on, on that conference and, you know, in terms of what do we hope to achieve by the hosting of such a conference? Well, that's a conference. It's called the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association Regional Conference. It is a, a, a sub grouping of a, a, a wider um, parliamentary association which is called the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. So our regional body is made up of about, uh, not about, but actually 19 Caribbean territories, mm -hmm. uh, the Leeward Islands, the, the Windward Islands, the, the Great Antilles such as Barbados, Trinidad, Jamaica and Guyana and then there are about five others, Turks and Caicos, um, the BVI, Bermuda, um, I'm missing two others, Belize, yeah, that's one, and the Bahamas. So there are about 19 members of this association. And each year for the past, um, past well, we are, we're having the 42nd such yes. conference. So we, we have been going for, for quite a while. This is our turn now. The last few were held, I think, is Barbados, then the BVI, and then I think last year was in the Bahamas. This um, is the first time it's been hosted here. This is our second time, actually. The last one was back in 2001, if my memory serves me right, or the, the information that I have. And so it's it's been quite a stint. Well, there are a number of us, so it will take a while for our turn to come back around. And so from the, uh, the Friday the 16th, um, to Friday the 23rd of this month, the conference begins. The, it, it, that weekend we have a number of functions um, held more under the auspices of the, the women's fraction of the conference called the, the Women's CWP, um, the Caribbean Women's um, Parliamentary Association. So that weekend they have a number of, of their uh, functions more related to them. But the main part of the conference begins on the Monday um, where we'll have an opening ceremony. We'll have what we call plenary sessions where mm -hmm. we'll meet as parliamentarians and discuss a number of matters related to the functioning of, of, of parliament. There's going to be an annual general meeting where we 
um, elect um, chairman and, and, and vice chairman and secretary treasurer. Um, um, a part of the conference would be a youth parliament that will be held later in the week. I can say there are about 13 presiding officers or speakers already registered. So that's, that's a good um, number, um, almost two thirds of the, the total number. And so we, we are happy for that. And in addition to the, the speakers, there are some over 90 delegates who will be attending. And these are made up of, of parliamentarians, elected parliamentarians, nominated parliamentarians, and also clerks of, of the various parliaments. And so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big if event. It, it brings together, like I said, a large number of um, parliamentarians for us to sit and discuss parliamentary um, affairs, parliamentary matters, mm -hmm. and of course we have certain um, events or act activities where we do, we actually have voting of uh, to elect certain persons in, into various positions. Yes, now what is the theme? Could the theme of the conference is enhancing democracy through the use of the parliamentary system and the media. So that's where I think someone like you would would, would come in. Yes. And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll, you'll, you'll have a say. And all the other media houses, um, you know, would, would choose to to be a part of the open sessions and, you know, can come by and share their thoughts and ideas um, with us. Mm -hmm. um, I could say at this point that even though we are... It's a it's a regional conference, but um, all being the host and I being the chairman of the the conference, um, I will be inviting all the parliamentarians within the the federal house and the Nevis Island administration to join us um, to to share in the the activities that we have. Um, or notwithstanding the fact that there are what we call delegates sure. from each territory. Singus Nevis would have five delegates. Those delegates would have voting, voting rights and are expected mm -hmm. to be a part of the entire conference. But outside of that, there's going to be an, a special invitation to all parliamentarians within the Federation mm -hmm. to, to attend the, the sessions that, that suit them, sure. that they, they so desire to attend. Now, now there are three branches of government. You have the executive, basically, which is the prime minister and his cabinet. You have the judiciary, which of course is our court system and, 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 and the law and the, the prison system and so on. And then you have the, you have the, um, the lawmaking body, the legislature, yeah. or the legislative which of course you are the speaker of, which would include all parliamentarians. Um, in our system, in St. Kitts and Nevis, we have what you call a unicameral parliament. There is no separation. You have some, some places, you have a bicameral, mm -hmm. you know, you have the Senate, and of course you have the House That's of Representatives. Yes. Here we have everybody together, yes. both the elected and the non-elected. And we have, Another, you know, arm of government, basically, which I tend to consider perhaps the most important of them all, and that is the media. Because the media has a tremendous role to play in reporting on the functioning of parliament, um, you know, the functioning of government, um, the criticism of government, and, 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 and so on. And so the media, you know, has a role in terms of checks and balances to power. Some people don't like the media. Some people berate the media every day. But yet, here it is that we are having the, the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association Conference and the media features in it. I mean, it's in the theme. So it shows how important the, the media is. And all of these branches, from my knowledge, are supposed to be independent. Hmm. Right? You have the independent media, but you also have government media. You have 
you know, the, the, the executive, the, 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 the judiciary, and the legislature independent. Could you speak to this and in the independence of each or the relationship of each to, 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 to one another? Well, the truth of the matter, and this is my opinion, is that the, the independence of these bodies are, are relative and it's only up to a point. Um, so even though there is um, a lot of talk about they should be independent, it's really up to a point. And what I mean by that is this. Take, for example, the judiciary. Yes, it's, it's independent. Because the, the judges, the court system, really, they, they should work mm -hmm. as an independent authority. But even the funding for the functioning of the judiciary comes from government. Government is the one who appropriate funds yes. to to um for the for our court system and our judiciary um to function. So right away you'll see there's a relationship between at least those two bodies. Um Parliament is the same thing, whereby Parliament depends on on financing from government to function. Mm -hmm. You know, so right away there, there is that that re relationship. Um, the media, government has a stake in the media or a particular body, in our case, SKNIS, mm -hmm. is, is an arm of government. Outside of that, though, then there's the independent media. Yes. So there, there comes a point where there's some overlapping, some relationship between these bodies, albeit that the 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 function the the the, the functioning is is in my opinion independent of each other and that's a good thing because it's 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 um it's necessary for 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 that independence to for the functioning to be rooted in that independence because once we we do not have that then we start to run into some difficulties you know but, but so. you know you know the speaker in our system in our parliamentary democracy, um, sometimes there seems to be some sort of, you know, um, overlapping between the executive and the legislature. They seem so intertwined. In other systems, of course, you can clearly see the independence, but in our system, the winner takes all, the first past the post sort of um, system the executive really dominates um, in the parliament and, and whatever comes to the parliament in way of bills and so on, you know, basically are passed because they have the majority. It's a majoritarian model. It is not, um, our parliament is not based on our, our, our electoral system, proportional representation. And so there are some flaws in my mind um, to our, to that system and, and so on. But nonetheless, you are the Speaker of the National Assembly and your role is basically one that is independent. However, you have become, how must I put it, a focal point for a lot of accusations um, from the opposition of bias. They said that basically you hear that word democracy, that you are stifling democracy that your rulings are unfair um, when the motion of no confidence um, came up in your leadership of the parliament they were told that you, you, you basically were ruling on your you know you needed to recuse yourself because you were ruling on something that you know you were the person who was on trial um, then of course we had the ejection of three opposition members um, from the parliament, the leader of the opposition, of course, who recently, you know, leads the charge in asking for a walkout in parliament. He's leading that now, and the others are following the leader. You had the, the Senator Nigel Carty, and you had most recently um, the Honorable Conris Maynard, who have all been ejected from parliament for behavior that can be deemed unparliamentary and disrespectful towards the chair. 
they have accused you of being one-sided and biased and and so on what do you have to say in your defense well, mr williams to me it's a pretty uh, straightforward matter meaning this parliament is governed by a set of rules which are rooted in in law these rules are called the standing orders the standing orders are a part of a, a, a body of law called the national assembly elections act so the, the rules we use in the house it's it's law that in my opinion they are set out in a very clear manner um the speaker has quite a wide ranging has quite a wide ranging authority and discretion through those rules that that is a point that must be understood and accepted by one and all and so once i was elevated to the position of speaker each and every time during parliament that i have been called upon to make decisions make rulings as we go along i have been always minded that my ruling must be consistent or in line with standing orders and so even though i've been hearing the criticism that my rulings have been say favorable to the government side it is, it is the opposition members who seem to be getting the the brunt or being the brunt of my rulings the point must be made and this is a very important point in my opinion i can only rule on an event that happened at the time a member saying something a member doing something and so i rule based on a specific event and if it's a case that the event is such that or the events that have taken place so far has resulted in only the opposition members being being booted out of parliament so be it but they were based on what happened at the time we cannot generalize things we cannot say only the opposition has been thrown out of parliament we must say well for what reason what happened at that time so far to the best of my knowledge three members have been asked to leave parliament honorable nigel carty honorable denzel douglas honorable Conris maynard in each instance it was for gross disorder in parliament gross disorderly behavior which is which is very specific it's well defined in the standing orders only the speaker has that the call as to what he constitutes gross disorder in each instance i was of the view that their behavior was grossly disorderly i won't go over the specifics of the case right now but you know um so that was a decision i made so i would never accept the fact or, or the criticism that only the opposition has been thrown out of parliament we, we have to look at each case um yes. you know Th there has been a case that i read um probably over a year ago about the <coughs> speaker of the new zealand parliament and he basically kicked the prime minister out of parliament he threw him out of parliament that is um um i think it's 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 john key who's the prime minister and do you think if there comes a point where the prime minister is in contravention of the rules of parliament that you can ask him to leave but of course any member who whose behavior is considered to be grossly disorderly shall be asked to leave parliament it is as simple as that because but, but everybody it, is equal in that in that law making e chamber isn't everyone it? everyone is everyone is equal but in 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 saying that you know i i challenge the general public i challenge the media if they can think of any instance where a member of the government bench um 
his or her behavior was, was tantamount to, to gross disorder, I'm willing to discuss it and say, well, you know, I guess I heard I should have asked that member to leave parliament, but I cannot, I cannot relate to any incident in parliament where a member of the government bench behavior, you know, um, fell into that category. Mm -hmm. I cannot recall any member being yes. disrespectful to me. I, I must make that point. So, you know, we cannot yes. generalize things. Mm -hmm. We'll take each case. <laughs> you, you know, there, there are some persons, of course, in the society who who have compared you to the speaker, the past speaker, which is Curtis Martin, and who, you know, says really big, your conduct of the parliament, you know, um, compared to his conduct of the parliament, that there is basically no comparison. He was so flagrant and 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 so um, abusing his 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 authority within the parliament and so on, and that is definitely um, something that people in the society have said. Calling, um, you know, parliamentarians by their first names and all that sort of a thing in in the parliament. Um, so basically, now when you compare, some people are saying, "Well, what is really going on here?" Do you think, Speaker, that there is a, is a concerted strategy on the part of the opposition to really bring this order to the House? Because every time the opposition comes, you become the target, rather than the debate itself. Well, I'll answer it this way. Um, I, I would not allow myself to get caught up in the, the rhetoric, to get caught up in what is said outside of Parliament. I'm, I'm aware of a number of things that are being said and so on, but I, I will know when to address them. And I can give an assurance that um i i'll more i think i'll more address them within parliament yeah i wouldn't want to characterize or, or <laughs> assume anything that it is a plan or not a plan of any member to um to do anything you know i'll mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll deal with matters as they come before um as they come up and I'll tend more to address sure. them in Parliament. Um, because, and maybe it's an opportune time for me to say this, uh, there's something called um, contempt of Parliament. Mm -hmm. And if I'm ever of the opinion that, that the behaviour of a Parliament falls within that category, there are ways and means of dealing with it. You know? So uh, the long and short of it is, I, I think the rules of the House are sufficient for me to act accordingly mm -hmm. and again i will act uh, on 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 the case at hand rather than looking at dealing with everything with a broad brush so you are you are not deterred by the criticisms of the opposition i guess that's another way of putting it mr williams it it phases me not i am always of the view and would remain resolute that i am acting Just in accordance with what the standing orders allow and I'm being fair and I will continue to do so. So you will allow the, the country to be the judge? I have said that repeatedly and thanks for reminding me of that. The country, the public at large will continue and I, I ask them to be my judge. Yes. I have no difficulty with that. And you know why? The work of parliament and parliamentarians is, is, is doing the work of the people. You know, that's one of the reasons why I, I do this mm -hmm. and I would continue to do it, sure. which I don't think happened in the past. Parliament had too much secrecy and too much um, mystery um, which attended it and I, I don't like that, you know. Um, parliament and parliamentarians, we are working on behalf of people, the common man in the street, well all levels of society and people need to understand the workings of parliament, sure. you know, so that's why I'm here. Yeah. Now, the, mm -hmm. now the Public Accounts Committee. Yes has been the subject of a lot of debate and 
accusations, of course, of the government not being transparent in terms of how it is spending money and all that sort of a thing, you know, have been leveled at the government. Um, and of course at you as well, because he's saying that you should have something to do with the, the Public Accounts Committee and calling for it to be set up. Now, at the last sitting of Parliament, we were told that, you know, that the, the, the committee is to be established and all the relevant persons have been informed and written to and so on to form this committee. But there's also something else that we are hearing and that I have read in the news is that now the committee you know, is to be set up and so on, that the opposition is saying, oh, they're only setting it up because they're having this um, CPA conference here, and so on, and so on, and so on. But it, the whole issue is that you've been calling for it to be set up. And now that there is movement to, to, to set it up, to put it in place and so on, then we hear another criticism. So really, what is it? Well, first of all, I, I am not distracted or even concerned about the criticism. The fact, I'm more concerned with the, the facts as they relate to the Public Accounts Committee and it's, 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 um, it being established. When I was elected to the position just under a year ago, I indicated there and then that I will do everything in my, my authority to have the Public Accounts Committee established. In accordance with the standing orders i think it's section 70 of the standing orders which says that there shall be a public accounts committee and so for since that time i have been in dialogue with the 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 honorable minister of finance prime minister because it's the minister of finance yes. who, who who it falls to to actually do the 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 le legislation the resolution to yes. establish such a committee i've been in dialogue with the attorney general office and uh, you know, discussing that very thing. Interestingly, what we found in our discussions and our research and so on, it's a very interesting, very interesting aspect to it, is that since 2000, there have been three public accounts committees which were established after the 2000 election, after the 2004 election, mm -hmm. after the 2010 elections, federal elections. They were established. There was a chairman, they properly established. But it is as if the committees never function. There, there are no reports that were ever made, submitted to Parliament, which is a function of any public accounts committee. Yes. There's nothing on file, nothing in, in, in what, let's say 15 years, um, to show that the Public Accounts Committee was functioning. And so the question was, well, why was that? Why was a committee established but there's nothing to show that they function? And then I think we came up, we mean in the persons I have been discussing this matter with, with, with the reason. It was a simple reason. Even though the standing orders stipulate that there must be a Public Accounts Committee, there were no, no regulations to to indicate how the committee should function. As a matter of fact, section 70 of the standing orders is just a small paragraph, maybe three or four um, paragraphs, which speaks to the Public Accounts Committee, very general. And so the question I believe that the committees that were established in the past face was, well, how do we function? Yeah. How, how do we go about studying the accounts of departments and so on? That's just my, my thinking. So it wasn't properly established. It was properly established. Properly but it, established, yes, but, but didn't dysfunctional. Have any, yes, did not have any, any guidelines, any regulations as to how they go about doing their, their business. And so as a consequence of that, of all finding that doing the research, I personally have been in contact with other parliaments across mm -hmm. the region sure. doing the research to find out how do the the functioning ones the the, the um function and we've come up with uh, we've seen a number of models the office of the attorney general is is working on legislation detailed legislation to to <coughs> to bring to parliament to assist the public accounts committee which should be established um, sh very shortly to help them function and function properly because 
if we, and again, this is my opinion, mm. if, if another public accounts committee was established um, months ago, it probably would have faced the same problem. Yes, the names are on the paper, uh, the, 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 the members are known, but what do we do next? Yeah. And so we're trying to deal with it in a comprehensive way. The Honourable Prime Minister has indicated that he has nominated the three who would sit on that committee and he has written to the leader of the opposition to nominate two members, one of which will be the chairman of the committee. I'm not sure the status of the response from the leader, but um, come next week, Paul next week's parliament june 13th we expect that that the, the there'll be the first reading of legislation associated with the establishment of a public accounts committee do you think that the noise for the establishment of the public accounts committee was more to do with the goal of wanting to paint the government as not being transparent that there was some sort of a hiding in terms of financial management um, taking place? I will answer that this way, uh, Mr. Williams. And again, this is something that, that, is, that I, have, I have garnered uh, or become more um, knowledgeable about as a result of the research. There is legislation on our books. As a matter of fact, legislation that is rooted in the constitution of our federation, which speaks to a director of audit office. Interestingly, it seems like public accounts committees mm -hmm. as as um as reflected in, 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 in our standing orders, it seems that the duties and so on of a public accounts committee are very similar to the director of audits yes. office. But the director of audits office is, a, is an independent body. It has wide ranging authority to examine all of government's accounts and of the statutory bodies. So the point I'm making is that I don't take the point or the criticism that government accounts are not properly audited because by law, by the constitution and the director of audits office, that body is, is the, the most, um, what's the term I'm looking for? It, it, it is the body yes. that really audits public accounts and that of statutory bodies. As a matter of fact, we have to be careful in the establishment of the Public Accounts Committee that we don't introduce anything that runs in conflict to say the Director of Audit's office. Mm -hmm. I'll give you, I'll, I'll, I'll make one point further. No one under the Constitution, no one has the authority to direct the Director of Audit. Th that body, that office, no one in our country can direct the Director of Audit to do anything. So, even when the Public Accounts Committee is established, we have to be careful that we, 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 we don't have the, the Public Accounts Committee giving instructions. So there's no interference. Exactly. So yes, a Public Accounts Committee is, is, is rooted in, in law for now, mm -hmm. but we are going to, to beef up the law and make it more detailed. And we may very well end up with two bodies scrutinizing public accounts of government and of statutory bodies. So, now, now mm. some time ago, about over a little over two years ago, basically, the Speaker then of the National Assembly, I heard this myself. Timothy Harris, sit down. Sam Kanda, sit down. I heard it. Now, is this allowed in the parliament? And why are members not allowed to call each other by names, but rather by member for number six, member for number three, member for number two, member for number seven, and so on? Why? Well, the procedures of parliament, um, they, they're long standing. Our 
procedures we use are based on the, the British system, the United Kingdom system, which have had the parliament for hundreds of years. I think it's 800 years now. And so we, our, our, our rules are, came out of those. And one of the reasons why a member should not refer to another member by name is, is out of respect for the proceedings of parliament to, to maintain the quorum. You know, what will happen if a member speaks to another member, John Jones, why you don't, you, you know, it will then deteriorate. And so by, by tradition, a member should refer to another member by constituency, St. Christopher One, um, the Nevis One. Sure. The speaker though, and I do it, I do refer to members by name because the speaker is allowed to refer to members by name, mm. the speaker. But I, I always try to, if I'm going to use a name, also say the, 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 the constituency number. So I'll say um, St. Christopher One, member for St. Christopher One, the Honorable uh, Marcella Liber, member for Nevis Nine, Honorable Mark Bradley. But I deliberately do that so the listening public could know who is speaking, who just spoke, so they could follow along. So that's basically why I do it. Mm -hmm. Because I guess in the past, you could be listening to a debate or parliamentary proceeding and you're not sure who is speaking. Yes. Uh, and when they finish, you're not sure who spoke. It's all part of the educating the public and the children following. They need to know, well, who is St. Christopher One? Remember, and if you repeat it, sooner or later we all would, would, would follow along. Mm -hmm. The example you use, though, I would not do that. You would never hear me refer to a member by name, simply like that, Vance Amri. No, I would never do that. I yes. would say, Honorable Vance Amri, member for Nevis 10, you know, to be consistent. Yeah, yeah. So if what you relate is the way it happened, um, I, I would think that was out of order. That's, the way That's all happened. I would say. Mm. Okay, no, now, there's a diff is there a difference between when you ask somebody to withdraw and suspension, the naming of a member? What do all these things mean? Yeah, those are three different ways of um, disciplining a, a member. The, the three instances where members were asked to, to leave parliament, that they were asked to withdraw, and it was just that. Withdraw for the rest of the day sitting. You know, that's so one withdraw. way. Okay. That's withdraw. It's not considered a suspension. Mm -hmm. um, a suspension is when you're actually um, named um, and you're asked to, to, you're suspended for a period of time. It could be for five days, ten days, or a time period determined um, by parliament. That's mm -hmm. an actual um, um, suspension. And the naming of of, of, a, of, a, of a member. It's a very specific procedure because um, at that time once a member is named the speaker will say member for constituency num whatever number you, you're hereby named and I would call his name then the next step is for me to ask a, a minister on the government bench to, to move a motion that the member be suspended so once you're named, you will be suspended and you would have to leave parliament and you will have to be away from the, the precincts of parliament. So it, 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 it's a stage, um, it has stages. For how long can you be suspended from um, the parliament? Is there any it's rule? different. Um, it's the first time, a first time suspension could be five days, a second time, 10 days, a third time parliament could decide that number of days. Um, but the most drastic uh, measure that a speaker can take is if, for example, the speaker asks a member to withdraw, leave parliament, he refuses, then he could be named. And if he still refuses, um, that member could be expelled from parliament for the rest of the, the what we call a session, the rest of the, you know, normal yes. five year mm -hmm. session. You know, so, so that, is, that is the most drastic. That's the most drastic. That, that's yes. okay. Mm. Now, we hear a lot about motions, resolutions. Could you explain what these mm. are? Well, motions is a general name that's used. These are just proposals brought to Parliament 
by members for, for approval. Mm -hmm. They're basically proposal. Um, now, resolutions, um, uh, those are, for example, last parliament, there was a resolution to dealing with the finances where government had the authority to, to have loans up to a certain amount and uh, resolutions would end with the word, be it resolved that parliament, you know, whatever the terms of the resolutions are. In a way, all, all resolutions are motions. Motion is very wide. A motion mm -hmm. could be basically anything. A resolution you now is, is very, very specific. Sure. Um, a motion could be um, like a, a motion in the a no confidence motion in, in the speaker, in the government, you know. What, or, what is basically the status of that? Did the, the opposition um, resubmit a motion of no confidence? No, they never did, even though in my ruling, um, the the ruling did indicate um, that the opposition is free to amend the the not not amend but to to submit a, another motion bearing in mind the the guidelines of that what, motion what, of what, the was there a time in which that they they would have to do it was there a period no, in which they would no. have to resubmit no, no there's no time period related to that i believe there may have been some confusion with respect to time periods but my understanding of it is if the resolution sorry not the resolution if the motion was debated and brought to a conclusion in parliament i believe under our rules i do not think another motion could be submitted within a six month period okay. subject to correction but I, I think that's one of the rules but in this case it, it was not debated and, and while we're at it mr williams that's something i i, I need to clear up or oh, uh, uh, continue to try to clear up the matter was not debated so my examining the motion that came before me and determining that it was out of order was quite in order that's yeah. that's a function of the speaker any motion that comes before the speaker any motion the speaker must first examine it and determine if it it is in good order which is exactly what i did it was mm -hmm. it was flawed it was fundamentally but, but they, flawed. They, they were making a case that someone else should have examined it you should have recused yourself you were not in a position to make any sort of a judgment on it because you were the subject that's, of that that's, motion that's of that's a baseless suggestion because guess what if i did that i may very well have, have violated the rules of the house which says any motion that comes before the speaker, the speaker must examine it, has the right to examine it and determine if it's in order. The speaker can actually amend it in his own way and place it on the place it before the house for debate. The speaker has that authority, that discretion. Mm -hmm. Now, the question would I would more um, wish to to, to lend some credence to is if the matter came to, up for debate well then that's another matter yes i as the speaker would have made a determination whether or not i hear the motion or whether or not i pass it on to my deputy speaker but that's a decision to be made by the, by the speaker at a later date there have been few motions of no confidence in speakers anywhere in the commonwealth and we operate within the commonwealth system uh, and and the few that I have researched, uh, I believe I came across maybe three, and I believe in two of those, the speaker heard the debate. You know, uh, so we we it's it's easy to suggest how something should should work or uh, give opinions, but at the end of the day, there are rules. To be followed yeah do, do you think that the the reasons for why it was thrown out are, were frivolous no of course not the, the, my ruling um was was a, a substantial or substantive in nature it was detailed it it referred to many reasons it gave many reasons why it was flawed it was out of order it it was it was ridiculous up to a point. Yes. Because one of the things asked for in the resolution was that all of my actions prior to to all of my actions leading up to the motion 
the, the motion actually said that they asked in the house to say that I was impartial. No, it's not for me to guess <laughs> what they meant, whether it was they meant to say partial. It's not really for me, but the point is, if you set out a set of, of a, a preamble, and at the end of the day, what you ask for is totally inconsistent or contradictory to what what was yes. in the preamble, it makes a nonsense of the matter. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I must state it like that. Right. You know, plus my name. At the end, my name was referred to as, uh, I think it was Michael Nigel Perkins. What, in parliamentary well, well, that operate, can be interpreted. Like, I think Nigel was foremost on the opposition's mind. Uh, that for, for, for some reason, perhaps, that he had been unfairly treated. Um, I mean, he of all the parliamentarians have been ejected from the parliament on two occasions. Well, again, it's not for me to, to, to figure out or uh, speculate as to why well, my name was... Well, I said my name, but <laughs> was it my name? Y you see where we're going with that. So, all I said in my ruling, tidy it up. Yes. You're free to come again. It was never done. And the one other thing which I will forever speak to was that, or is that, rulings in the House by the Speaker can be challenged. There's a mechanism, the rules, um, the rules um, spell out how you can challenge any ruling of the Speaker. The member must come with what we call a substantive motion. Come with something in writing, outline your case, and we will debate it. Guess what? The House could find that the Speaker erred, you know, based on the debate. But it has never been done. The opposition has failed. Yes, you, do you, that. you know, we, we look to Parliament as, you know, some people call it the hallowed chambers, but, but when we look nowadays, we basically cannot call it hallowed. There, there is such a violence, I want to call it violence, that takes place in Parliament. And the only thing that we have not come to as yet is basically people crossing the floor and start to throw, throw licks. In some other places I have seen where it has come to that. You know, whether they take off the shoes and they throw it or whatever the case might be. Um, and in most parliaments around the world, of course, you have very heated debates and so on. They tend to be noisy and they tend to be contentious. But in recent times, what we are seeing in parliament is a certain hostility, of course, towards you as speaker. There's a certain anger. There's a certain language that is probably unparliamentary. And there are people in the country who are saying, we really cannot stomach this. We, 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 we really want our children to sit down and to, to look at parliament. But it is, so, it is so disgraceful. What do you have to say about this, Speaker? Well, I must agree with you on, 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 on your comments. Um Mr. Mr. Williams, um, we have seen a number of unfortunate um, incidents in, in Parliament where um, members um, have chosen to go down the path of even saying personal things, which is an absolute no-no in, in Parliament. As a matter of fact, I have heard things in Parliament that I have ignored let me admit it I have ignored because I simply do not want to repeat it so I ignore it you know I am not sure what the public is picking up from the microphones if they're hearing some of the things I must say though I believe I'm seeing a lessening of that in recent times of the of the personal attack I hope it's it's a trend downward which will come to to an end sooner than later in terms of the the, the, the boisterousness and, and the, the robustness of the, the debates mm -hmm. and so on, uh, that's expected. Parliaments across the world... Usual banter. Yes, that's expected. The, and the crosstalk is expected. Of course, it's up to the Speaker to control that. What my greatest um, disappointment has been, um, and what I find to be most distasteful, again, is the level of, of disrespect shown to the chair, to myself as speaker. That is, is, is a no-no mm -hmm. um, to, to, to 
a, a large extent. The, of course, the, there are instances elsewhere where we have seen members uh, attack speakers, but you know, it, it's really a no no. It's, it's certainly not in keeping with good parliamentary, you know, procedures and, and the decorum of parliament. But in our case, um, there's nothing wrong with the the boys, boys boisterous uh, of, of the, the, the you know having robust debates and so on and and, and we're in a real world <laughs> meaning in our federation we had a government that was in um, office for 20 years having members we now have members who are in that government on the other side on the other side and 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 one well in, in, in this case the prime minister who is who was with government is now in another government yes and so the you, you will have heated debates we, we have to be real you will have criticism of of a government that was in office for 20 years then you'll have that criticism from the opposition of the present government so we have to be realistic about our actual situation you know <laughs> One of, one of the criticisms I, I find um, that some people have of parliament and so on is an opposition in opposition only to oppose. When something good is happening, can the opposition say something good is happening? And if there's a point that the opposition makes, can those on the government side say that the opposition has made a good point. I think there's a certain level of objectivity that we must have. Everything must not be subjective and to oppose. I hear you, Mr. Williams. And again, you know, um, what's my response? We, we're living in a real world. Um, we are dealing with politicians who are vying for elective office and and who maybe feel that if I support what the other side says whoa I'm I'm I'm, I'm supporting I'm giving way to that person that member you know but it is not so it should not be like that it should not be like that you know and that is why I would continue to say that you know as a speaker I I look past that and I just deal with what's before me, what's being said when a member is on his feet, you know, and... Um, but, but, you know, we have a discerning, and if you have any discerning electorate, you can't tell me that when you're in power, something that you had put in place and so on and supported, and as soon as you get in opposition, you no longer support it. I ask myself, what the heck is going on here? Just because you're in opposition, now you become the opposer of that which you had enacted or was trying to enact. It makes a mockery and, and, and basically a, a sort of, um, how must I put it? Are we a society of fools? Well, Mr. Williams, again, I, I hear you. I hear loud and clear, but, you know, thankfully, how should I put this? The, the standing orders do not, do not speak to such instances and so uh, you know I, I would I would take my arm um, take my leave from that point by saying you know, because they don't speak to such well you know I, I can't really comment and I simply look past uh, right know, now, now speaker what is the point of order because I am I am myself I am confused what a point of order is because nowadays it seems to me every time there's a point of order what emanates from that is disorder so what is the point of order? Well, again, it, it's pretty simple in my opinion. The rules are governed by what we call standing orders. So when a member raises on his, on his feet, or rises to his feet, and says a point of order, that member should actually be indicating to the chair that a member has done something that is not in keeping with the standing orders. Mm -hmm. Now, Traditionally, and or by custom, the speakers before me and now me, we 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 there's some 
we allow a little flexibility on the standing orders uh, and we most times you don't ask the member well point out to me which of these standing orders um the member uh, presenting is in violation of we, we don't really do that but the speaker can at any time do that you know so the, the speaker tends to listen what the member is saying what point is raised it should be a very short um statement and rule whether or not okay point taken ask the member to withdraw not withdraw mm -hmm. you know well and, and and i can i can speak to um the last sitting where a member was rising on a point of order and i chose i directed that no there will be no point of order at that point and mm -hmm. and that was for a very simple reason because if someone is presenting and the speaker is of the view, the person hasn't said anything controversial, nothing the person said at that point comes anywhere near controversial. Well, there's no way a point of order could be raised at that point. And so the speaker, you know, has, has, has the authority, has the discretion to, to, to decide whether there's a point of order in order at this point mm -hmm. and so that was one of those cases yes. um and the speaker has the authority to 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 preempt to to think about where the member is going with his point mm. meaning if the person did not say anything controversial how then could someone rise on a point of order the two things yes. don't mesh. Yeah, yeah. That is what happened in that case. Right. Now, when yes. you're on your feet, could other parliamentarians be on their feet at the same time? No, the rules are clear. There's one particular section which says once the speaker rises to his feet, the house falls silent. No one should be should be speaking. Or, that yeah. means everyone else should take their seat. And take their seat, yes. And take oh, their yes, seat. Yes, and take their seat, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Now, in terms of the order paper, of course, mm -hmm. the order paper determines um, the discussion in the parliament and so on. Now, who determines what goes on the order paper? Well, the, again, the order paper, that is um, pretty much fixed. There's a standard order paper. Yes. Like the program of the day's it is events. Fixed. It's fixed. Mm -hmm. But I'll qualify that. But there's a qualifier, meaning at the start of parliament, um, leader of government business can rise to his feet and indicate he would like an amendment sure. to the the other order paper. And okay. once it's carried, you know the other paper is is amended. Okay. You know. Um, what, no, one of the reasons why I ask that, who determines what goes on the order paper? Because I remember in the previous administration, there was a motion of no confidence that never got on the order paper. Um, and, and that's why I'm asking such a question. Who determines what goes on the order paper? For example, you have a motion of no confidence, which um, just came before you. Um, it was heard basically in very quick time, in the sense that it, was, it wasn't debated, but it was brought and shown to be um, flawed and so on. But before I know that there was a motion of no confidence, yes. Um, for probably over two years that never made it on the order paper. So the question I am asking is that who determines what goes on the order paper and who determines what does not go on the order paper? This, the speaker, the rules are clear. Once a motion is, reaches the speaker, he examines it and he, he will decide whether it's, it's in good order to be placed on the order paper. Or he can amend it, he can change it and put it on the order paper. So it is the... It is the speaker who, who does that. It is okay. his call. Okay. Yes. Right. Mm. And uh, the standing orders uh, of the parliament, can they be amended? Yes. The standing orders can be amended. Um, and again, that comes to the form of a, of a motion. Um, anyone can bring a motion to amend any section of the standing order. Um, in, in certain motions, though, can be brought... Um, during a sitting, you know, it, it, with, without writing. There's something called um, um, notice. You have to give notice of a motion. So uh, in, in the case of a, an amendment to, say, a standing order, a member would have to indicate mm -hmm. that amendment in writing uh, at least three days before the sitting and, and so on. But there are certain things 
um, that Jew in a city, a member can just rise and move a motion um, of the house. Sure. Yes. No, now you have bills that come to Parliament and they have their first reading and their second reading and their third reading um, before they're basically passed into law. Now when they're in law they become acts. Yes. They become acts. So it's a bill first and then, then, act. then an act. What, what is this first and second and third reading of bills? That, that is just um, nomenclature for the want of a better term. Mm -hmm. that's, that's just how it's um, described. But it's a very simple um, explanation. The first reading is just the, 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 the House approving that the, a bill be heard example um last sitting we had the advanced passenger information system bill some time ago that was read as the first reading yes then that is all that happened it was read the name of the bill was read it sat for a period of time and that's for the public to discuss it uh, you know mm -hmm. people to have an input and then it's brought back for a second reader, reading at some appropriate time that um, yes. that when it's placed on the other paper. <coughs> at that second reading, that is when you have the actual debate, the discussion, the, the, the each member or contributing to the merits or or the, the flaws of, of the bill, you know. Um, following that second reading and the discussion, the debate, you have the third reading where the, the 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 bill is pretty much just read out the name of the bill is read out and its objectives mm -hmm. and then the question is put to the house that the third that the bill is read for a third time and passed and once the house approves that then the bill is passed and shortly after that it is um any amendments it's it's tidied up the speaker would sign off on it yes it is sent to the governor general for his signature what we call his assent and then the last step is it being gazetted okay it is only when it's gazetted that it becomes law it becomes law okay that that means when it is published when it is In publication when it is published when mm -hmm. it's available to, the, to public. the public yes okay and for the for the obvious reason i mean you can't have a law or a bit of legislation. I'll put it in a draw. I may have heard that phrase before, um, but you can't have a law that nobody knows about. It, it must be available um, to the public. Okay. That's when it becomes law. Right. Now, now Speaker, yes, we're now available to the public and, and we are going to go to the phone lines and yes. to, to, to take some calls if there are people who want to call. And the, the, the numbers to call, we're opening the phone lines. The local number is 465-2555. That's the local number. And the overseas number is 1-718-577-2916. The lines are now open. Okay, Speaker Perkins, we the there has been a lot of criticism in terms of the statements by ministers that are made in Parliament, and one criticism is that the ministers take up all of this time, tracked basically from the debate in the house the opposition is saying that they are not given a chance to contribute towards the, the debate because the ministers on the government side take up a lot of time in giving personal statements do you think that there is any fairness in that statement Working for you, good afternoon. There's a caller. Working for you. Working for you, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Letroy Williams. 
And good afternoon, Honorable Speaker, Carl Brown here. And good afternoon to the listening public home and abroad. Yes. Uh, Honorable Speaker, um, I listened a bit and then I went off to do something. I come back listening now. Um, one of the things I would like to remind the general public, and I hope the opposition will be listening tomorrow when this is recorded on Freedom Radio from 7.30 in the morning to 9.00. Because there is a lot of things that I heard you say. A lot of them have been in Parliament for many years and don't seem to know the rules or don't seem to take time out to study, digest, and read the rules of the Parliament. That is why they behave so um, rude and very disrespectful to the House when they, when they do come in. Right? To let them know that the opposition can bring things to the parliament, can get, um, well, I would say bills or any other item on the other paper is not just the government side. And I have found that many years and many governments come, I think it was only once or twice it was done before, and I think none of the time that it was done before, it got to the parliament for debate and discussion. I wanted to inform the public and the opposition members that the opposition can bring items to go on the other paper that can be debated in the parliament. The, the other thing is, um, I find that the opposition keeps, well, it seems like they want a war between you and them. And they keep saying that you're very unfair to the opposition and you seem to be solely put here to do the bidding of the government. But I don't find it so, so. Because I find that at times you tell the government side to, to you know, go back to the debate and you ask them at times to, to sit. One of the things I find quickly before I go is that when you rise, you can hear the opposition and you can hear some of the government members uh, grumbling over there and it comes through very loud on the mic, on the radio and when you're watching it on the TV. So if you could, you know, let them know again and brief the house before the house really starts. I see you do it a few times and let them know there will be no disturbance, there will be no disobeying and you will carry out the ruling of the house. I go on, sir. Thank you. Speaker, would you like to? Um, the, the caller is right in terms <clears throat> of um, the fact that opposition members can bring items to the um, to parliament. There, there are two ways. One, it, they can come in the form of what we call questions. An opposition can ask a question of any minister of government. It must be put in writing, though, and presented sure. to the to the to the speaker. Uh, I think it's three days before. We have another yes. caller on the line. Working for you. Good afternoon. Present. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Williams and to the honourable speaker there. I'm sitting here and I'm listening, and it is a blessing to listen to this program. I think it is very educational. It is very good for the students that are at Clarence Street Royal Baron School who are undertaking their law. And I am glad that I am alive, that I can listen to this program and I could give some information, some worthwhile, some valuable information that one did not know about to my children and grandchildren and friends about the, the, the proceedings of Parliament. I very much appreciate it and congratulations to you Mr. Williams and to the Honourable Mr. Perkins. Congratulations. You are doing a very good job. May the Lord God Almighty bless you, give you strength so that you can continue to teach the youth of today. That is what our young people need to stabilize them in this world. Thank you sir. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Another caller. Working for you, good afternoon. 
Yeah, good afternoon, I'm host, and I'm the Honourable Speaker. I remember sometime this year in one of the parliamentary sessions, there, there was a request by the opposition to meet with you. It seems as though a team versus yourself. I was just wondering if it was a wise decision on your behalf to meet with them privately, one against four or how many in the, in, uh, in the House, because knowing that they do have stronger propaga um, propaganda capabilities than you have, because they have access to radio stations, which you would not want to go out and do in your position as um, Speaker of the National Assembly, at least for any kind of comments of radio. Thank you. Well, thank you, sir. Just to update you very quickly, that meeting was had. It was not simply between myself and the opposition members, I did invite the deputy speaker, the clerk of the house and the deputy clerk to that meeting. So um, my side was well represented, sir. <laughs> Working for you, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I was a, a bit concerned um, at the beginning when the speaker basically said that, well, although we're supposed to have independent branches of the government that they're not really and truly independent because of things like um who finance them and that sort of thing um that's a bit concerning right i i, I feel that I, as far as speaker in particular he should do his utmost to make sure that all the branches are independent the second thing is there was a ruling at one stage where he basically said that I think one of the opposition members was, was calling for the Prime Minister to withdraw um, some suggestion that he made. And the ruling basically said, well, it's a he said, he said kind of thing. And since we can't verify it, then he would not ask him to withdraw it. I would have thought that the proper thing to do, was, since it could not be verified, is to ask the Prime Minister to withdraw it. Because that means if he doesn't do that, anybody can say anything in Parliament and it goes scot-free. Okay, and I agree with him finally that in the, in the final analysis, the public is who will judge his performance as, as, as a speaker. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Working for you, good afternoon. President, good afternoon to you, Lashoy. Good afternoon, sir. And President, good afternoon to the Honorable Michael Perkins here. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, Mr. Perkins, during the course of the ascension to the um, Speaker's chair, from day one, it was recognized that you were met with, with what you call people who didn't want you there. But let me say this. You know, sometimes we forget that we are human beings. And when something is not being done prior, I mean, you don't have um, a president. Because in our little time as an independent nation, nobody ever got up in that parliament that I know of and object to the ascension or the nomination of anyone to the speaker's position. Never been done before. That was done to you. Lest we forget that you are a new vision, not trying to be xenophobic or anything, and so was the Honorable, um, what do you call him, um, Herman Leibold. I am still alive, and I'm seeing something done by a Labour Party coming to fruition again, all over. Where one, he was referred to as a new vision, can't come to sink it and tell me what to say and how to sit down. You know, we must take these things in stride. But what I'm saying here, I want to commend you for your stern and diligent approach to that speakership. Because let me tell you this, I watch, I listen, and I'm of the opinion they are very, they, I don't think the Labour Party, since, you, since the government change, has ever come to debate any bills that come confrontational. And more confrontational it's going, be, it's going to become. 
And I'm sorry, and I'm saying to you here, sir, when it becomes confrontational, and you agree it's confrontational, and it's out of order and lack of decorum, you must put down the rule and just don't, and name them. Stop using this thing about them. Um, withdraw. It comes a time you have to put down. You see, our, our crime here is getting out of hand because sometimes we fail to do what needs to do to curb the crime. And I'm calling on you, sir, through this medium, to stop naming them because they come there confrontational from the onset. They start grumbling, calling you dirty names. And we, we hear it all the time on the, on the radio and, and watch it on the TV. And it coming from a particular sector of parliament. And you must not tolerate it and start to name them. Okay. Because when you name them, they will realize they no longer can represent the arm. Um, the constituency for a period of time. And this is what needs to be done. Stop playing footsie with them and be stern. Okay. I I want to compliment you to the fullest for your job well done and okay. keep doing the good work, but be more stern. I'm okay. expecting that because they're gonna come confrontational every time. Don't okay. expect oh. less than being confrontational when it comes to you because harm and libel went through it too, sir. Thank you, have a nice day. Thank okay. you, sir. Okay, Speaker, we, you, you can take those. <laughs> yes, um, I really don't want to go back a bit to and complete an answer to a question you asked me to do with statement by ministers, ministers and yes. the length of time to take. Now, the, the chair, let me say this, the chair, that the Speaker has no authority now to, to limit or to curtail a minister of government presenting statements by ministers. That is an item on the order paper. I have heard um, a criticism that we should limit them to a particular period of time. No, the chair has no authority. Even though our standing orders say that if if the, 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 the standing orders are silent on any matter, we can re refer to the UK House of Commons rules. The tradition, the yes. Westminster. It, it doesn't stop there. It, it, it is qualified by saying that um, for us to apply any restrictions to any member in the House or anything that done is done in the House, it has to be approved by the, our very same House. So I cannot restrict a Minister of Government from speaking at any length he wishes during statement by Ministers. But the more fundamental point to me is that it is part of the standing orders, ministers giving statements during that time is part of parliamentary procedure and conduct. It is part of, we may not use the word debate, but it is part of the business of the house. So a minister has all rights to present his statements there and then. So I think people you, need to understand that. Yes. Um, you know? But do, do you think that there can be some discretion? Well, again, again, it's not for me to say that. The, the way I look at it is that... That would have to come from the minister. The minister, or even if other persons or, or entities or the public at large, <coughs> if there's an outcry then, look, this thing is too long then it is for people to impress upon members, parliamentarians. Um, you think there's a better sure. way of doing this? That's how I would, you know, mm -hmm. um, ca characterize it. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, there was a caller I wanted to address another caller, um, a question that was asked to do with opposition members making um, contributions and bringing motions. Yes, that can be done. <coughs> An opposition member can, apart from bringing questions, hard, real questions to, to, to ministers, there's an opportunity for that called questions. Another part of the other paper, the, what we call on the public business, it can be government mm -hmm. business, can be bills, motions. It can also be um, motions coming from opposition members. Sure. You know? Now, so, now some of the other callers basically in were congratulating you on your... Um, your conduct of the the National Assembly. They, they really were not asking questions, so to speak, but rather commending you on your your being stern and really holding the fate 
where the, the rules of the parliament are concerned and not to be deterred. There are two questions I want to ask you before we leave. There, now, there are many questions I would like to ask you, but the time does not permit. One of them has to do with where do you envision parliament will be at the first session, that is this five-year period? And the second question, did you ever imagine that your work would be this difficult, this challenging? That's the first question where I would like for Parliament to be at the end of the first session, session meaning the end of a five-year term. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that we would, we, in terms of our, the technology that we use within Parliament, mm -hmm. Our audio system, our, our there's something called Hansard, which is like a recording system for yeah. everything that is said in Parliament is recorded and so on. Uh, we, we, we're looking, we're in, doing our research now on on procuring and, and the muting of the mic. Yes, yes, procuring the necessary equipment to to upgrade mm. um, how we do things within Parliament. It's quite a stressful job on the yes. stenographers in terms of the translation, and so you know, in terms of Hansard and and our microphone system, our recording system, or, or general technical equipment within the use of Parliament, we are already have already started discussions on a new Parliament uh, building, and uh, we are aggressively seeking to to find a site for it. That's the first thing we have a few options at hand and that, is some, that will be something um, I'll be working on along with the support of, of, of all um, um, to bring to fruition as quickly sure. as possible. And the third thing I would hope to see within Parliament has to do with how we conduct ourselves within Parliament. And I'm hoping that I'll see a, a lot of improvement from certain members um, of, of, of Parliament. And yes, we can have our lively and robust debates, but let decorum prevail. Well, one of the callers uh, was pretty much um, not on the bright side where that was concerned. In fact, the caller said that he thinks that he's going to even get worse. But there's one thing he said, that you must remain steadfast. It's going to get worse because the, the, the criticisms and so on will continue. Um, it's good to have hope. Yes. But at the end of the day, there are two other things. Faith and love. I will say this. I will say this. I, I heard the caller and I heard the suggestion that it will get worse. And all I will say on that note is that it may get worse, but it will be short-lived. Mm -hmm. I can promise that. Okay, good. And, and then you, did you ever imagine that your work would be this difficult? <laughs> um, I guess I never thought about it in terms of, of the difficulty or the, the challenges. I, again, I, I have no difficulty with the with that, with the challenges and the difficulty, I, I, there's one thing I have a difficulty with. The what level of disrespect that is shown to the chair at times. Think about it. Without that, we can have some pretty good, lively debates in Parliament. What is it about mm. you? What, what is it about you, Speaker, that is so aggravating to the opposition? What do you think it is? is what what, what what do you think lies there underneath why you have become a dartboard basically mr williams i'll answer it this way um when i dealt with the motion of no confidence there's something the standing orders that says you you, you can't just have um um, opinions and um, assertions and you must have evidence you must what you it must be substantiated with with evidence again I, I deal with the with the the, the the standing orders and what the rules say and so on so I hear you 
but it's something I I just look past. Even if I feel like that, I I, I just look past it. You know, because if I tend to focus on why certain things are happening, why a certain member is behaving a certain way, then I I get I get distracted. I I think from the job at hand. So I will sure. still focus on on presiding as fairly and as transparently <laughs> as I can and in accordance with the, the rules sure. and the standing orders. Okay. All of the things are um, non extraneous in my opinion. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, I didn't answer your question. Non-essential. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Before we go, I will give you two minutes or so to wrap up. What would you like to conclude um, by saying? Well, I, I must say I was moved by the uh, a female caller who express uh, appreciation for us doing a program like this and I get and that goes to the the, the the root the main reason why I have chosen to do this and I will do it mm -hmm. more often and yes. I would in, in extend it further to my, my, my staff you know the deputy speaker the the, the, the the clerk of the house the deputy clerk for us to come back and sure. report to the public and clear up matters and so on mm -hmm. so that caller who, who thanked thanked me and, and, and the two of us for having this program. I, I thank her, I appreciate it, because she spoke about the, the children and college students and so on. And that is the intention, so that people out there, the man on the street could understand Parliament, what Parliament is about. Mm -hmm. I, I will forever say, I did have a problem in the past, that Parliament seemed to be this body out there functioning at some level that nobody know what they're talking about and the terms used and all they could remember is the arguments in parliament but no we, we parliament is part of of our, sure. our system of our, our way of doing things touching on people the everyday people and so on and it's my job to make it as simple as possible and you know i appreciate you having me and i i will be back again well i certainly you know. appreciate you being here uh honorable speaker there, there are some things that i would have learned today and i i want to express my gratitude for your coming and sharing with us the functioning of parliament and because many people let's face it sometimes don't know this is the education of the public is always important for something that is so vital to our political life the the the, the legislature and basically how it how it functions so I want to thank you, Honorable Speaker. You keep the faith. Thank you too, Mr. Williams. Thanks for having me. And you keep the hope. Thank you, sir. And if it's the will of the Lord, I'll be back. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> well, I want to thank you so much for tuning in today and listening to Working For You. I had with me the Honorable Anthony Michael Perkins, who is the Speaker of the National Assembly in St. Kitts and Nevis, speaking to us, of course, about the upcoming Commonwealth Parliamentary Association regional meeting to be held in St. Kitts from the 16th, I think 16th to the 23rd, and also about the functioning of our National Assembly. I am your host, Les Roy Williams. I thank you again for tuning in and listening to today's program. We will see you next week. Working for you. A weekly talk radio program which highlights developments of national interest and the activities of your St. Davis government. Join host Les Roy Williams as he presents news, views, reports and interviews about everything regarding the activities of the Team Unity government and the building of our communities and the development of St. Davis. Tune in and call in to interact with your government and share your views regarding the upward forward development of your community and our beautiful Twin Island Federation. Working for you is weekly, every Wednesday live from 1.30 p.m. to 3 p.m. on ZIZ Radio, with FM, and Sugar City FM with rebroadcast on participating stations. Working for you.